Okay, we are returning to our logo after a weekend, and we need to get kind of reintegrated. So remember, we have some slides for logo design creation basics, which are a helpful reminder to you of the differences between vast, uh, vector graphics and raster graphics or bitmaps. We have the different kind of main approaches to iconic logo design. These are picture-based logo designs, and those are different than logo types, which are different than combined marks, which will put the two together. As we're finishing our logos, we want to remember that they need to be clear, engaging, and versatile. This is different because a lot of art we want to really draw and be engaging, but sometimes we do that by adding a little bit of confusion or a little bit of um, struggle for our viewer. Logos are meant to be easily recognizable, right? And that's where the clarity comes in. Versatile means that they can work at any size and with any kind of color variations and with any kind of effects like drop shadows, colors, gradients, textures. And so we are designing them first and foremost just as kind of black cutouts. And then the three uh, helpful approaches that we played with in our sketches for our proving ground were central symmetrical, dynamic, or a play with positive and negative space. And the play with positive and negative space can either be central symmetrical or more dynamic. It just depends. These were uh, my sketches for this semester. And I actually really like the positive negative space one. That would have been a lot faster to do, but I've wanted to do this version for a while. So that's what I'm working on. Even though it's a little fussy for a logo, it still reads at a smaller size because we're redesigning our basics. Vector shapes can just be built with simple shape tools, but it's understanding where the shape starts and stops, kind of the subtleties between them. But we can also use, of course, more complex tools to draw our shapes to, to help cut out our curves and our straights. And Illustrator is the program we use for that, Adobe Illustrator. It didn't used to be Adobe. And that is why it is so markedly different than Photoshop, how even some of the same functions have a different name. And that's because it has a different origin. But the pen tool is the classic tool that you can use in Illustrator. You can also use it in Photoshop for selections. But in Illustrator, it creates these really clean paths for us. And then there are the other tools I like, like the pencil tool, the blob brush. But those all create kind of extra anchor points. So the pin tool is the way you can delete those anchor points. You can clean it up at the end. Here are some little tutorials for it, how you have to pull out your curves as you go in different directions. And it's not at all like drawing. It's, it's very much its own skill set, but worth learning. All right, and then some helpful kind of things you can add. I might add some texture to mine at the end. I'll show you how to do that. And they keep going, right? So the blob brush is my favorite. Instead of the brush tool, which I almost never use, the regular paint brush tool will give you a stroke and then give you a customized shape around the stroke. But the problem with that is you really can't control what the actual shape is. So the blob brush instead gives you a filled path with no stroke. And that's what we want. But notice how many anchors it gives you. The smooth tool is very helpful, especially with the pencil tool, but if you overuse it, it can overgeneralize some of your sharps. So it's just all a balance. And then the way we are going to save our work, I'm going to start with this today, even before I'm finished with my black logo. How do you save your black shape logo and then bring it into Photoshop to make print ready? Because you can't print a vector except on a plotter or on a cutter, right? A vector has no pixels, so we're printing on, on fine art printers that are pixel-based. So we need to take the, we don't have a laser printer. A laser printer would print the, the vector perfectly in curves. Instead, we use the vector to give us exact pixel dimensions that are going to be cleaner than any other kind of pixel dimensions we can get. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And the way to do it is as we're working on it, this is our working format, we save it as an AI file or an AIC file if it's in your cloud. But when we 
are finished with the black shapes, we're gonna save it as an EPS, and that allows us to bring it into a different program. Some of you are already there, so I'm going to show you that even before I'm finished with my logo. So to do that, I'm actually working on some things for the library show, and it's for a, um, a Kurt Vonnegut exhibit. His birthday is November 11th, and this November 11th would be his 100th birthday. So the centennial. So I've created this vector, and I'll show you some of those finishing techniques. So I simply took one of his drawings, which is of this asterisk, which is kind of famous in his writing, and it's actually his drawing of a butthole, which is funny, but anyway. Then I'm to show you some of those texture effects, I, I keep a catalog. There are some in Illustrator, but I keep a catalog of textures. They're in my digital art folder. I have them under assets. Uh, these are my distressed textures. They really help with t-shirt designs because if you do a, a plasticine ink of just solid shapes, you'll have t-shirts like this. They'll crack when you wash them. They'll kind of crinkle and feel thick on your chest, right, if they don't have openings. So it's nice to build in some kind of retro texture to soften them up a little bit. So I use these distressed texture EPSs, and they look just like this, right? If I just preview them, all they are are just scans of shapes turned into vectors. I'm not going to wait for that to show you the clean vector. Oh, that's a PNG of it. But I use the vector version of it. And then I tie all those up, right, in different ways. So these are just clean little vectors. What's funny is this kind of distressed vector file takes up way more memory than our logos because that's a lot of anchors, right? A lot of little points, even though it's made to seem kind of random and just textural. So at the end of the day, this is my product. It is, let me see. There we go. It is this. So this has the vector shapes, but it also has some holes punched into it, right? So if I, and I'm just going to do this for prints for the library for a show, kind of one-offs, but this would also work best as a t-shirt design of this image. And it has those kind of uh, spots in it. Okay, so now I'm done with it. How do I save it? Right now it's an AIC file. It's saved in the cloud. So I'm going to say save as, and I have to do it to my computer in order to, to change format. And the, the way I'm going to save it is always with my name. This isn't really for the class. I won't put the semester code in it. And some sort of description of it. And I'm going to save it to the desktop. I want all of you to save it to the desktop so you can see it clearly. And the format is a new format called EPS. That's a transferable format of vectors. SVG is as well, but EPS is even more useful between Adobe products. So if I save it as an EPS, this is actually how I'll give my vector files to clients and to vendors. But because we are also the printer, not just the creator, I'm going to show you how we now make it print ready for our printers, which are fine art printers. So I can see the EPS file here. I'm going to mark it as yellow. And then I can close Illustrator and open up Photoshop. Now, this is the main thing I want you to know because it's not that intuitive. You do not want to lose all the advantages of your vector. So what you do not do we're going to open up the EPS with Photoshop, but we're not going to click on our EPS file and open it directly with Photoshop. Because if you do that, this is what happens. It will ask you before it can open it how you want to rasterize it. Because it's a vector file, it can be any resolution you want. It's infinitely scalable. But this makes you, makes you force it into a resolution. Does that make sense? And we don't want that. We want the versatility, the flexibility. And we can get that within the Photoshop file by doing this. We say file new in Photoshop. And then because we are printing these for the midterm at eight inches by 10 inches, 
And we're going to use our lab resolution. Professional resolution is 300. We're going to use 350. Just in case we ever want to make it a little bit bigger, we can easily. So I'm going to build that in. 8 by 10 by 350. Now I have just a blank white at the right resolution. It's kind of like an artboard in Illustrator. Now I drag and drop my EPS onto it. And you'll notice that EPS, which can scale to fit anything, will automatically fill the shape from side to side or from top to bottom, whatever the limiting size is. Now, this comes in as a smart object. It will not rasterize um, across the board. This EPS would be able to be resized no matter what. So I could change my canvas size to 30 by 40 inches and then just scale up this smart layer or this smart object and it will automatically be the perfect resolution for that new size. So what I'm going to do now is actually scale it down a little bit because this is the perfect way to think of how to make things print ready. So if I want to print this for the library, for this show, I want to decide exactly how it should look. And we have black mats for our prints. We'll need them. If we don't have them yet, we'll need them by Wednesday's class, right? And what I want you to picture is that this is the white space. This is the 8 by 10 window of your mat. And this is the black mat floating around it. So you decide exactly how you want it to look to make it print ready. So I can nudge it from one side to the other a little bit. I can even, because this is one of Kurt Vonnegut's drawings, he did many, many, many of these and then made prints. And this is just for educational purposes for this show. I also made a, um, let's see, I think it's in my downloads. I made a vector of his signature. So I have it here as, as a PNG, you know, from a scan of one of his prints. But then I took it into Illustrator and turned it into a vector, which makes it a whole lot cleaner. Right. And I'm going to combine the two a little bit to make for a nice signature at any size. So first I bring in the EPS. Just to show you how this works, I'm going to scale it down a little. And there you see it. Right. And now I can add a little bit of that texture into the signature by using the JPEG. This is compositing skills, right? taking that opacity down. This is just all the things you want to think of when you're making something print ready. All the little effects you might want to use. This is now the part of digital art where you're really thinking about the end product, the physical product which is a reason I like teaching this class instead of just a graphic design class or a digital communications class. Because I like the end product of the fine art. Right? So now I've got a signature there that has a little bit of that texture. I can play with the blending mode. There we go. That works well. I think I like the hard light. Then I'll add a little bit of just the normal. Take its opacity down. Good. So that's going to print nicely now. Okay, so once I have my finished file, I save this in a different format. First of all, to save memory, I'm going to flatten it. 
I'm going to merge all those layers together once I'm sure of it. 